back. Okay, chemistry 1411. One of the last concepts that we looked at in class last week, last Friday, was talking about calculating the pHs of strong acids and strong bases. And I asked you to memorize the six strong acids. And uh, you notice here that I have one, two, I have seven strong acids, don't I? Well, that's because um, I learned general chemistry too from a different textbook than you guys are using right now. And so I asked my good friend, Dr. Diaz, I said, does, does uh, chloric acid, does that count as a strong acid? And he says, in some textbooks, yes, and in other textbooks, no. And so for our class, since we're using the OpenStax textbook, what we're going to count is are these six acids here. Those will be considered the strong acids. So don't worry about chloric acid. You only have to know the six that I have, the blue underlining, okay? And then also we went over the strong bases, what the strong bases were. So with that in mind, we already solved question 22 and we solved question 23. And I wanna take a look at question 24 with you. It just asks us nothing more than to calculate the pH and the pOH of a couple of solutions. These aren't difficult problems if you understand that when you see sodium hydroxide, you say, well, that's a strong base, right? And if I have a strong base, it's going to be a strong electrolyte. So that means the sodium hydroxide is going to break apart 100% irreversibly into sodium cations and hydroxide anions like that. Now it says we have 30 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution. So that means we have 0 0.10 molar of sodium hydroxide. Now initially, we can consider the sodium hydroxide as being unionized. We consider it as if there's no sodium cations and no hydroxide. Now we know that that's not true because it occurs instantaneously, right? The ionization is an instantaneous process. As soon as the solid sodium hydroxide um, connects with water, it touches the water, it separates into its ions. But ionization is a state function, and so we can write out an ice table. And what's going to happen is all of that sodium hydroxide is going to dissociate to give you sodium cations. And since I'm starting it with 0.1 molar here, I'm going to lose all of that, and I'm going to make 0 0.10 molar concentration of sodium cations and a 0 0.10 molar concentration of sodium hydroxide. That's how much it's going to increase in the chain. So at equilibrium, we're not going to have any of sodium hydroxide, um, any of those ions conglomerated together, but we're going to have 0 0.10 molar sodium cations, and we're going to have 0 0.10 molar hydroxide anions. Now we're asked to calculate the pH and the pOH of the solution, and we've got the concentration of the hydroxide anion. Right, it's right here, 0 0.10 molar. And so when we calculate our pOH, we know that pOH is equal to minus log times the concentration of hydroxide. So we know that pOH is gonna be equal to minus the log of 0 0.10. And we get the pOH, remember that pOH and pH are dimensionless numbers. So if you take the negative log of 0 0.1, so we take 0 0.1 and take the negative log, you get 1.00. Now, since pH, and this is a formula that we looked at last week, pH plus pOH is equal to 14.00 at 25 degrees Celsius, we can say that our pH is going to be equal to 14.00 subtract 1.00, and we get that our pH is going to be equal to 13.00. There's our pH. Makes sense, right? Because we have something that's really basic. And we discussed this last week that when you have a basic pH, it has a high pH. And when you have something that's acidic, you're going to have a low pH. All right, so there you go. Now, just one thing I want to point out before we move on to B is that the volume had nothing to do with the question, didn't it? it had nothing to do with the question whatsoever. But you're going to see that the volume will come into play when we answer C. Now, let's take a look at the next one. So it says you have a 40 milliliter solution of 0 0.025 molar barium hydroxide at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, I'm kind of running out of space here already, aren't I? So let me move some of this stuff out of the way here. And I'll have to be a little more careful with my 
with my slide slide space management. Okay, so let's take a look at B, and I might solve this one a little quicker. Um, we have barium hydroxide, BaOH2, right? Barium is found in group 2A. And so we have our barium, which is aqueous. There we go. So that's going to break apart into a barium 2 plus cation and two hydroxide anions. Now, I'm not going to draw the whole ice table this time. If you look in my solutions, it's probably in there. But since we know that the ionization is 100%, if we're starting out with 0 0.025 molar barium hydroxide, the ratio of barium hydroxide to barium is one to one. So when that ionizes, you're going to end up with 0 0.025 molar barium cations. But the ratio of barium hydroxide to the hydroxide anion itself is one to two. So that means we're going to end up with double the concentration of hydroxide. So we're going to end up with 0 0.050 molar hydroxide. All right, there we go. So we've got our concentration of our hydroxide. And again, if you're wondering, why did you double it, Mr. Dion? Where did you get that? It's because of the stoichiometric ratio of the barium hydroxide, our base, to the hydroxide anion. Well, let's take a look. Let's calculate our POH. Our POH is going to be equal to the minus log of 0 0.050. We have two sig figs. Therefore, we're going to report our POH to two decimal places. You take the negative log of that and you get 1.30. Our pH is going to be equal to 14.00. Subtract that POH. And we get that pH is equal to 12.70. So we have our pH and we've also calculated our POH in both cases. Now, what it's asking us for in the last part in C, it says, what if you made a solution of both A and B? Now, the answer is here in parentheses, but we're going to figure this out. Okay, we, have a, we take this sodium hydroxide and we mix it with this barium hydroxide. What are we going to get? Well, let's think about it. And again, I don't have a lot of space here, so you're going to have to kind of bear with me. I might be writing a little bit small. But from part A, so from A, Let's calculate how much hydroxide we have. All right, we know that we have 0 0.10 moles per liter multiplied by the volume, which is 30 milliliters. 30 divided by 1,000 gives me 0 0.0, so this is 0 0.0300 liters, so times 0 0.000 liters. You can see that the volume cancels, and you end up with 0 0.0030 moles of the hydroxide anion. From the second part, our hydroxide, we have 0 0.050 moles per liter. And this time we have 40 milliliters. So we're going to multiply that by 0 0.0400 liters. Volume cancels out. And we end up with 0 0.0020 moles. So this is the total amount of hydroxide we have, right? If we combine those two, okay? So if we put um, number of moles of hydroxide is going to be equal to 0 0.0030 moles plus 0 0.0020 moles. And that gives us, you can do this in your head, 0 0.0050 moles. So that's the total number of moles of hydroxide that I have, okay? But it's asking me for the pH. So I'm gonna need the concentration of my hydroxide, but the concentration of the hydroxide is gonna equal the number of moles divided by the volume. So I have 0 0.0050 moles total. What's my total volume? My total volume is gonna be 30 plus 40 milliliters. So that's 70 milliliters. So that's zero, oops, that's 0 0.0700 liters, like that. And when you punch that in your calculator, you get a concentration of hydroxide that is equal to 0 0.071 molar. I'm going to just double check that one quickly. So 0 0.001 divided by 0 0.07. There we go. Yeah, looks well, good. Um, two sig figs. So I have 0 0.071 molar. 
hydroxide. And so to calculate the pH and the POH isn't much of a stretch. I mean, I'm sure everybody can do it faster than me. Our POH is going to be the minus log of that. So we take the minus log of that. We get 1.15, 1.15, and therefore the pH is going to be 14 minus 1.15, which equals 12.85. And that makes sense. You mix those two solutions and you end up with something. You end up with a pH that is in between this pH and this pH. It's not, you, you wouldn't necessarily take the average. Here it kind of looks like it's the average, but that's just a coincidence. Okay, so what's the take-home message from this question? The take-home message is that strong bases like sodium hydroxide and barium hydroxide are going to dissociate completely. They're going to ionize 100%. That's why I wrote these arrows, right? This is a 100% dissociation. This is a 100% dissociation, okay? Um, the other take-home message would be the formula for pH, that pH and POH respectively. So pH is equal to minus log of the concentration of hydronium or POH is equal to minus log times the concentration of hydroxide, all right? Also that pH is equal to, or sorry, pH plus POH is equal to 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. So this formula up here. So there you go. A lot of learning opportunities in this slide. Well, let's move on from there. And today we're gonna to spend some time talking about weak acids. And things get a little bit trickier when we're dealing with weak acids. And what do you mean by that? Well, oops, I didn't mean to that. Here. How do things get trickier when you're dealing with weak acids? Well, the problem with weak acids is that they don't ionize completely, right? A strong acid, again, and I'm repeating myself, dissociates 100%, right? It breaks apart completely into its ions. But when we have a weak acid, remember that the bronze dead lowry definition of an acid was something that could donate a proton. So a weak acid is going to ionize, right? It's going to donate a proton, but only partially or slightly. So if you look at the Ka values of weak acids, and again, we only have Ka values for weak acids. The Ka value for a strong acid would be infinity. But if we look at the Ka value for some weak acids, you can see the variation here in Ka going from 10 to the negative 2 all the way down to 10 to the negative 10. And the percent dissociation varies from around 10% to 0.0025%. And so if you think back to our last chapter, we did a lot of problems where we did ice tables and we solved a lot of quadratics in the last in the last chapter. But what we have here in this chapter is we're going to have a little trick that's going to help us avoid having to solve the quadratic in many of the ice tables where we deal with weak acids. Follow me. It says since the dissociation of weak acids is so tiny. To make our calculations easier, we're going to assume that the initial amount of HA, which is our weak acid, is virtually unchanged. Think about it. If it only dissociates, you know, 0.42 or 0.0025%, well, here's something that I hope you read in our textbook, is that Ka values are only known to plus or minus 5%. So there's an error of plus or minus 5% associated with Ka's, okay, Ka values. And so if our original or our initial amount of weak acid is changed by less than 5%, then it's not going to have any effect at equilibrium, is it? Right? Because we only know our Ka within plus or minus 5%. Now, if you're like, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Mr. Dion, well, let me show you the, the, the easy way to do it. Okay? It says if we assume that the initial amount of the weak acid is virtually unchanged at equilibrium, then we would say something like this. We say the initial amount of our weak acid is approximately equal. That's what those funny looking equal signs mean. When you see this, it means it means approximately equal to. Okay, so it's approximately equal to the amount of acid at equilibrium. So if you're making an ice table, here's your equation. You have your weak acid plus water gives you hydronium plus the conjugate base. Great. You have your initial concentration of your weak acid, right? You have none of these, of course. We know that. Then you're going to lose... A certain amount you're going to gain a certain amount over here but then when you reach equilibrium you say that the amount of the conjugate or sorry the weak acid subtract x is equal to the initial amount okay so if you're like really yeah really watch 
what you're saying is that this is equal to this. So that number doesn't change. You know, like, well, it should. You're removing something. Yeah, but if it's small enough, it doesn't change it enough or the, the change isn't great enough. So it's not going to affect the outcome of our X. And we're going to see this many times over the next few lectures. Now, if you're like wondering, well, when, how do I, how do I know that's true? Because I said it's an assumption and it's not true all of the time. Okay. Well, there's a couple of ways that we can verify this assumption that this, that this is cool. Okay. There's a couple of ways that we can do that. The first, and you're going to see me use both ways. The first way is this. If the initial concentration of your acid, so this is greater than 100 times the Ka value, right? And just do a back of a napkin calculation or just do the multiplication in your head, okay? If it's greater than 100 times the Ka value, then the assumption is probably good. But there's another way to do it that we, do, that we use even more, and it's probably more common. If you're the kind of person that likes to read everything you can find about general chemistry, or if you're uh, watching YouTube videos, you know, you're perusing the internet and looking for more information about this, you'll probably see the five, what's called the 5% rule, and you're going to see me use the 5% rule a bunch of times, okay? It says if the initial amount of the weak acid is within 5% of the equilibrium value, then the assumption is considered valid, okay? Um, now, again, the ionization is a state function, and everything has already happened, right? Um, all the ionization has occurred already at the beginning, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a stepwise procedure where we assume that the initial state, we have all of our weak acid or our weak base, and we're going to do that in a little bit. We're going to assume that everything is intact. No ionization has occurred. We're going to do our whole ice table, and then we're going to solve for X. And if our assumption is valid, we're going to be good to go. But if the assumption isn't valid, then we're going to have to solve the quadratic equation. Okay. Now, again, hopefully you've realized that by now, in general chemistry too, the best way to understand or to really figure out what the heck is going on with respect to any concept that we look at is to try a practice problem. So we're going to try question 25, and then we're going to try question 26. Let's just read the problem together. Question 25, it says, calculate the pH and the equilibrium concentrations of everything in a 0.1 molar solution of acetic acid. So we have a 0.1 molar solution of acetic acid. Now, the first thing I notice, if you go back here and you look at this rule right here, are we going to be able to assume the initial concentration of the acetic acid is the same as the concentration of our acetic acid at equilibrium? Well, it occurs when the initial concentration is greater than 100 times the Ka. Well, look at this. Is, here's the initial concentration. Okay, we're not doing any work yet. So 0 0.10 molar or 0 0.10. Is that greater than 100 times 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5? Well, how are we at? 0 0.1 is greater than 1.8 times 10 to the negative 3, right? I just did that in my head. It's much bigger. Okay. So in this case, the assumption should be okay. Now, that's not enough, though. As your teacher, I'm, I'm obliged to show you the 5% rule. So let's take a look here. It says, calculate the pH and equilibrium constant of uh, the 0.1 molar solution of acetic acid. So what have we got? We've got acetic acid. Remember, acetic acid is a weak acid. It's not in the list of strong acids. Sulfuric acid, nitric acid. Um, Perchloric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. It's not in that list. Acetic acid is found in vinegar. It's not a strong acid. So let's write out what would happen when we put acetic acid in water. We have our acetic acid, okay, AQ plus water, which is a liquid. It's going to be in equilibrium with the hydronium ion, right, because it's going to donate a proton. That's what an acid does. Now, the acidic proton in acetic acid is this one here. Okay, it's this last one. I know there's three, uh, three other protons over here, but this proton that I have highlighted in yellow, that's what we're always going to say is the acidic proton, and there's a good reason for that. Um, it's based off of the Lewis structure. Anyhow, so we have, we have our conjugate base, ACH3COO minus. Could anybody name that conjugate base? It's not a trick question. All right, we should have these kind of things in our everyday speech now.
Could anybody name that the conjugate base of acetic acid? It's come up a few times. It's in our textbook. It's the acetate ion. No, not acetone. Acetone is nail polish remover. So this is this is acetone. Anyhow, um, so this is acetate. The acetate ion. So we have acetic acid, acetic acid, and then we have acetate. Okay, acetate is an ion that is going to come up almost. 6.02 times 10 to the 23 times in this class. So you better know it, okay? It comes up a whole holy host of times. Okay, what do we got? We got 0 0.10 molar initially. Now remember, the ionization is a state function. You know that it, it occurs instantly, right? But we're going to make a nice table anyway. So we have no hydronium. We have none of the acetate. But we're going to have a change. We're going to lose some of that acetic acid, right? Because it's going to dissociate. You're going to form the same amount of hydronium and acetate that you lost of the acetic acid. So at equilibrium, you have 0 0.10 minus X. Here you have X. And here you have X. Now, what we're going to assume is that at equilibrium, we're going to assume that this is equal to 0 0.10, right? We're going to ignore the minus X. So then we can write our Ka expression, our Ka, which is equal to the concentration of hydronium multiplied by the concentration of the acetate divided by the concentration of acetic acid. I'm not going to do this every time because I know you guys know this frontwards and backwards by now. So it's 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 is equal to x squared divided by 0 0.10. So x is going to be equal to the square root of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 x which is going to be equal to the concentration of my hydronium because we're looking for ph right but anyhow it's going to be equal to 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 molar Let me just double check that 6 square root there we go 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 molar Shoot. Here I am. There we go. All right, so we have the concentration of our hydronium. Now, to solve the problem, all it's asking me to do is to get the pH, right? Which is going to be pH. You guys know this. pH is going to be equal to the minus log of 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3. Therefore, my pH, which we have two decimal places, is going to be equal to, what is it, 2.89. So that's not the only thing we're asked to solve for. But um, let's check our assumption. Okay, so you're going to do this on your next exam, your practice, right? We're going to check assumption. Okay, we said that this assumption is cool as long as this is less than 5% of this. Okay, this is the initial amount of acid, okay? As long as we make less than 5%, or there's less than 5% dissociation, we're good. So, what's the concentration of hydronium at equilibrium? It's 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3. We divide that by our initial concentration, 0 0.10, multiplied by 100%. Let's do that. 1.3 divided by 0.1 multiplied by 100, and we get 1.3%. 1.3% is less than 5%. Therefore, the assumption is okay. It's good. All right? So our assumption was totally safe in this case. We've already solved for our pH. We solved for the concentration of hydronium. The concentration of the hydronium is also equal to the concentration of the acetate like that and lastly to calculate the concentration of our acetic acid the concentration of our acetic acid is going to be equal to 0 0.10 subtract the x which was 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 and these are all molar right and we get that the concentration of our acetic acid is equal to what i got it written down here somewhere 0. 
zero nine eight seven. Okay, now that's got more sig figs than I can actually report in there, and so technically it remains unchanged. It's still zero point one zero molar based off of the number of sig figs that I have. But the take home message from this problem is that we were able to check our assumption ahead of time and we said, yeah, the assumption should be all right using the rule that the concentration of HA should be greater than 100 times the Ka. So that was cool. And then we did it again here, right? We checked the assumption again right here. We said the amount of acid produced during the dissociation is less than 5%, what we started out with at weak acid. So we validated the assumption twice. Now you might be wondering, well, Come on, Mr. Dion, aren't there examples where the uh, where the assumption wouldn't work? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. Let's take a look at question 26. It says, calculate the pH and equilibrium concentration of all species in a 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 molar solution of acetic acid. I mean, right away, you can see that the concentration of acetic acid, okay, um, is, how would I write that? Put this and then maybe put a blue X through it, is not greater than a hundred times the Ka, right? If the Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, if you multiply that by a hundred, you get 1.8 times 10 to the negative 3, which is greater than 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3. And so this doesn't hurt. So it doesn't hold true, sorry. And so the assumption is not going to work this time, okay? Now, what does that mean? Ah, uh, we're going to have to solve a quadratic, okay? So, there we already, sh I already showed you using the first rule, which is, you know, that HA um, is not greater than 100 times the KA. So, we can't use that. So, we're going to have to solve the quadratic, but come on, we can do that. Nothing we can't do. We're chemistry people, right? Okay, so let's write out what we know. We have our acetic acid. It's a weak acid. We put it in water. Don't be afraid of a quadratic. Everybody can solve a quadratic. You get the acetate ion. Okay, I wrote them in a different order this time, didn't I? Like Bobby Brown said, it's my prerogative. Okay, so I'm starting out with initially 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. I got none of this and none of this. I'm going to, son of a gun, <clears throat> I'm going to lose some of my acetic acid, I'm going to form some acetate and I'm going to form some hydronium. So at equilibrium, I've got 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3, subtract x, so I've got x and I've got x over here. Now we can write out our Ka expression. We did that on the last slide, so I'm not going to do it again. We're going to have our Ka is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, which is going to be equal to x squared um, divided by 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3 subtract x. Now these ones are a little bit easier to solve than a lot of the ones that we did in the last chapter. Remember we had to square the denominator. Those are a little bit trickier making those polynomials. So this one here, I went and worked the whole thing out and I got x squared plus 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5x subtract 1.8 times 10 to the, it should be negative 8, no is equal to zero, <clears throat> and then you solve, you solve the quadratic, just go for it, okay, and when you do that, you end up with a couple of numbers, only one of them is going to be valid, and that is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4, and so that means that the concentration of the acetate ion and the concentration of the hydronium ion are going to be equal to 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. So we've got that. We can also calculate our pH because pH is going to be equal to the negative log of 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4. So you get the pH, which should have two decimal places, is equal to 3.89. And then there's just a little matter of Recalculating the concentration of the acetic acid. Remember in the last problem, it it didn't matter, right? It was such a small change that we still left, using the correct number of sig figs, we still were left over with basically the same concentration. But here we can actually work it out. 
and we say that our concentration of our acetic acid is going to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3. Subtract 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4 molar, and we get that the concentration of our acetic acid has been lowered to, and I worked this out, 8.7. 8.7 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. Like that. There you go. We did the whole thing. Somebody asked, would we use the poly function on our, on our calculator to work um, to, to solve the quadratic? Sure, you can use the polynomial function on your calculator, or you can use the formula. All right, no problem. Either one is going to work in this class. All right, if you don't have a calculator with a polynomial function, feel free to solve the quadratic. No big deal. And if you look at our textbook, um, oftentimes, they'll, when they have a problem that involves a quadratic, they work out the whole thing. You know, they take the time. Here, since it's, you know, a uh, second semester university course, you know, I think I solved the quadratic once in the last chapter, but now I just say, well, solve it. So we kind of skip that part. All right. You know what? Something that would be fun to do here. I never thought about it until I was just talking. You know, a good instructor should always have three trains of thought going through her or his mind when lecturing. You know, the first one is what I'm actually saying to you. The second one, uh, the second one is, um, you know, what I'm working on, you know, with you guys or what I'm thinking about saying next. And the third one is just, you know, totally unrelated. Somebody says, can, for those of us who have to solve through the quadratic, can we get extra time? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, everybody gets the same thing in the universe. Okay. Anyhow, so if we want to check our assumption, and we know the assumption isn't going to hold true here. We already verified that ahead of time. That's why we did the whole solving of the quadratic. So if we take our concentration of the acid that was produced, we get 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4, and we divide that by 1.0 times 10 to the negative 3. Multiply that by 100%. So let's see here. Take 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4, divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 3, multiplied by 100%, and you end up with 13%, right? So that's definitely more than 5%. And so there you go. All right. Well, Matthew, there are plenty of calculators that are non-graphing calculators that can solve a polynomial. All right. Let's move on, and let's talk about the weak base, what we would do when we have a weak base. All right. Uh, no, or did I want to do question? Let's do that. No, I'm good. Let's do this. Let go back here. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just rearranging my slides here. Okay, let's move on from there and talk about weak bases. So we're going to see the exact same thing occurring with a weak base. It says very similar to a weak acid, weak bases do not ionize appreciably in water, right? That's why they're weak, okay? What was a weak base? Or what was a base according to Bronsted Lowry? A base is something that accepts a proton, right? Takes a proton. And so instead of dissociating 100%, Right? A weak base is only going to dissociate partially. Okay? Now, if we want to make our assumption and not solve a quadratic, well, we're going to use the exact same, the exact same assumption, but here we're going to do it for a base. Okay? So at equilibrium, we can assume that the concentration of base at equilibrium is equal to the initial concentration of the base if the initial concentration of the base is greater than 100 times the Kb. Or we could rephrase that and we could say that the concentration of the base must be within, within 5% of equilibrium values. Okay, 
the concentration of the base initially. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to do the exact same thing now, except we're going to try it with a base. Okay. Some weak bases. So let's take a look at question 27. It says, in a 0 0.010 molar solution of ammonia at 25 degrees Celsius, it's found that 4.2% of the ammonia has ionized. Well, this one, look at the look at what they tell you in the question. Do you think the assumption will be valid, the 5% rule? Can we ignore the change in the initial concentration of our base here, or do we have to solve the quadratic? Who could answer that? Which one would we have to do? Solve a quadratic or no quadratic? Based off of what they're telling us in the question. It's less than 5%. Hot diggity darn. So if it's less than 5%, we don't have to solve a quadratic. Exactly. Okay. So here we go. Let's start out with our ammonia. So we have ammonia. And we put that in water. And that's going to be in equilibrium with the ammonium ion, right? Because ammonia is a base, it accepts a proton, and then we're going to be left over with hydroxide. Initially, we're starting out with 0 0.010 molar, but they're telling us what the change is going to be, right? If you take 0 0.010 molar and you multiply it by 4.2 over 100, right? 4.2%, you end up with 0.00. 0, 0.42, okay, molar. So that means that the change, the change is going to be, you're going to dissociate 4.2%, right? So um, we'll put here dissociate 4.2%. So that means you're going to lose 0 0.00042 molar. You're going to gain 0 0.00042 molar over here, and you're going to gain 0 0.00042 molar over there. All right, so at equilibrium, we have our um, initial concentration of ammonia, which essentially remains unchanged. So we can use that as our 0 .0, 0 0.010 molar. Again, since it's less than 5%, the assumption is valid. And we end up with 0 0.00042 molar of the um Ammonium ion is 0 0.00042 molar of the hydroxide ion. So what's it asking us to calculate? It wants us to calculate the pH and the Kb. So we say that our pH, our pOH, is going to be equal to minus the log times the concentration of hydroxide. So we get pOH is equal to the minus log of 0.00042. We should have two decimal places in our pOH, which is going to be equal to 3.38. Our pH is going to be equal to 14 subtract 3.38. So we get that our pH is equal to 10.62, like that. So we've solved for that. And we know that our Kb, our Kb is going to be equal to the concentration of the ammonium times the concentration of the hydroxide divided by the concentration of the ammonia, which is going to be equal to 0 0.00042 squared divided by 0 0.010. So we get that our KB, I'll get my calculator, is equal to squared divided by, and we get, 1.8, 1 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 as our KB, right? We should have two sig figs in there. And you can also see that the assumption holds true, you know, based off of the fact that the initial concentration is greater than 100 times this, which would be 1.8 times 10 to the negative 3. So either way you slice it, we don't have to solve the quadratic. We got the KB. We got the concentration. What else is it asking us for? The pH, and we got the KB. There you go. There we have it. Any questions? So give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. I don't think it's a simple question. And we're going to look at another one here. Take a look at one more. All right, cool. 
yeah, it's, it's not easy. It's not, it's not a simple, it's not a simple subject, you know, it's not a simple, not simple concepts. So let's move on and take a look at question number 28, which deals with sodium acetate. Okay. Sodium acetate has an application of photographic development and textile dyeing. What is the pH and pOH of a 0.25 molar solution of sodium acetate? And it gives you the Ka of acetic acid. All right, we're given the Ka of acetic acid. Well, we've got sodium and we've got acetate, and we know that acetate is a weak base, right? We saw that in our last problem. We know that acetate is a weak a weak base. Weak base. There we go. So what's the acetate ion going to do? Well, we're going to start out with our acetate ion. That's in the carbon, aren't I? There we go. So we have our acetate ion. We know we have a solution that is 0 0.25 molar initially. That's going to react with water. In, in equilibrium with water, we're going to have acetic acid, right? Because the base acetate is a weak base, but it's going to take some protons. And then I'll be left over with hydroxide. All right, so I've got 0.25 molar. I've got none of this, and I've got none of this, and then I'm going to have a change. I'm going to lose some of this. I'm going to gain some acetic acid, and I'm going to gain some hydroxide as well. So in equilibrium, I'm going to have 0 0.25 minus X, and here I have X, and here I have X. The question now is, can we ignore X or not? Well, again, there's a couple of ways you could slice it. I would say, yes, we can ignore it because the initial concentration of our base is greater than 100 times the KB. And if you're like, Mr. Dion, you don't even have the KB. Well, I kind of solved for it in my head, okay? But let's solve for the KB. Since we're given the Ka of acetic acid, all right, we know that acetic acid, and I'm going to erase this in a second, but acetic acid is going to dissociate, right, in water. Just do this really quickly to give you the acetate ion plus hydronium, all right? And so then we can use the formula that since Kw is equal to Ka times Kb, the Kb of our acetate is going to be equal to Kw divided by the Ka for the acetic acid. So it equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, okay? So if we have 1 times 10 to the negative 14, and we divided that by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, we should get, yeah, 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. So you can see this is much greater than 100 times that. 100 times 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10 is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 8. So we can definitely make the assumption here, okay? And so our Kb, Kb is going to be equal to the concentration of acetic acid multiplied by the concentration of hydroxide divided by the concentration of the acetate ion. So we have our Kb, which is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10 is equal to x squared divided by 0.25. We solve for x, so I'll kind of skip a step here. So you take 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10, multiply by 0.25, then press the square root button on your calculator, and you get 1.2. x is equal to 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5 molar, which is going to be equal to the concentration of your hydroxide. Okay, we've got that. So now we can calculate our pOH which is going to be equal to the negative log of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5, so POH, is going to be equal to 4.93. Do I have to show you the formula for pH is equal to 14 minus POH every time? Probably not. So our pH is going to be equal to 9.07. So there's our pH, and there's our POH. All right. There we go. So a weak base. 
Here we could make the assumption. If you want to check it, you know, I didn't do this when I practiced it. Okay, but if you want to check, what would you do? You'd say the concentration of base produced should be less than 5% of the base that you started with. So we take um, 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5, and we divide it by 0 0.25. Multiply that by 100%. Minus by 0.25. So it equals a really low number. I mean, it's 0.0047 or 48 roughly percent. So we'll just say less than 5%. Okay. So the check works, the verification works. You know, we're very safe um, with our answer. All right. If you need more practice on this, there's some really good problems in our textbook. It's questions 14.9 to 14.14 in the chapter itself. And just to give you a heads up, these are really um, worked out with very nice guided solutions. And I think they start with problems that are pretty simple and they, they get to something maybe a little more complicated at the end, but only five problems. So if you're not following me all the way, what would I do if I was you? I'd say right after class, I'd grab my calculator, some scratch paper, and I would try those problems without looking at the guided solutions first and then maybe take a look at the solutions after you've gone through them because there's some very good opportunity for practice there, okay? All right, well, let's move on to something different. And now we're gonna move on to section 14.4 where we talk about the hydrolysis of salts. So salts where we have um, something that's gonna dissolve in water and break apart into ions. And you might be wondering, well, what does salts you know, have to do with acids and bases. You know, if you think about table salt, like what does that get to do with an acid and a base? Well, that would be a really good question. A very, very good question. Um, let's say you took table salt, just good old table salt, and you put it in water, right? You make some brine, okay? That's what salt water is, salt brine. Um, how does that affect the pH? Well, the answer is it doesn't really affect the pH of the water. But what if you took something like ammonium bromide, okay? NH4Br, that's a salt too. Okay, it's made of an ammonium cation and a bromide anion. Will that affect the pH of the water? And the answer is, yeah, it will. Okay, and if you're wondering, like, why is that? Well, that's part of the reason we're here. Is we're going to answer that question. Take a look at this. It says if you have a salt like sodium chloride, right, table salt, potassium bromide, or lithium perchlorate, those ions don't react with water molecules. And there's a good reason why, okay? But, um, however, when salts can containing acidic or basic ions like ammonium bromide, sodium acetate, potassium fluoride, when those ones dissociate in water, those ones will react with water molecules and they do change the pH. Now you might be like pulling your hair and go, what's the difference? They're just salts, man. What's the difference? Well, let's take a look. We're going to go right back to, remember when we talked about strong acids and they had weak conjugate bases? And when we had weak acids, they had strong conjugate bases. When we had a strong base, it had a weak conjugate acid. When we had a weak base, it had a strong conjugate acid. Well, it's back, okay? So take a look at this. It says, salts that consist of the conjugates of strong acids and strong bases don't change diddly squat, okay? The solution is still going to be 7. That's why table salt, sodium chloride, doesn't affect the pH of water. It's because sodium is a cation that's found with sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And so it has no effect on the pH. And chloride is the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid is a strong base, or strong acid rather. So this is a very, very weak base, and therefore it doesn't affect the pH. Now, and, and I have, and if you're like, well, can you show me this in a table or something? Yeah, yeah, it's coming up in the next slide. Well, let's take a look at ammonium bromide first. You have ammonium bromide and you make ammonia. Ammonium is the conjugate acid of ammonia, which is a weak base. Ah, so that means that this is a strong enough acid to affect the pH. Bromide, on the other hand, is the conjugate base of hydrobromic acid, which is a strong acid. So this is a weak base. So the bromide won't affect the pH, but the ammonium ion will. All right. Now, if you're like, oh, boy, I'm confused with all these conjugates and acids and strong and weak and all this stuff. Well, um, let's take a look at it here. And it says at the bottom here, it says salts that contain the conjugate of a weak acid or a weak base are going to affect pH. That's all you need to know. As long as you know what a weak acid and a weak base is, and you know that their conjugates are going to be strong enough to have some kind of effect in water, you're going to be good to go. Now, if you're like, 
well, come on, this should be on there so many strong or so many weak guys, so many weak bases. How do I remember them? It's anything that's not going to be the conjugate of a strong acid or a strong base. How many of those were to, to memorize? Six strong acids, roughly six strong bases. So it gets a lot easier then. Okay. So again, what are the kind of cations and anions that aren't going to have any effect on the pH of the solution? The conjugates of strong acids and strong bases. Okay. Things like chloride, bromide, iodide, right? Nitrate, perchlorate. Okay, those aren't going to affect pH because they're the conjugate bases of strong acids. Cations like these metals right here, group 1 and 2A metals that come along with bases like lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, mag hydroxide, right, calcium hydroxide, so on and so forth. But what's going to, what kind of cation, or sorry, what kind of ion would render a solution basic? The conjugate bases of weak acids, right? That's what all of these ions up here. Now, there's none in the cation department, so maybe I'll simplify it here. But all of these here, these are all conjugate bases of weak acids. What did we say? We said weak acid, strong conjugate bases. So that means that these bases have got the chutzpah, or they've got the They've got the je ne sais quoi. They've got the, the ability to, to uh, affect the pH of a solution. If we look at ions that can render a solution acidic, we have the hydrogen sulfate and the, the dihydrogen phosphate anions. Why would those be able to render a solution acidic? Because they are actually the conjugate of even, they're the conjugate of weak bases, okay? They're also, they're the conjugate acid of weak bases. They're also the conjugate base of strong acids. So those um, can affect the solution. They can donate a proton. And then also if we have ions like an aluminum ion, which is a Lewis acid, or if you have an ammonium ion, that's gonna show up quite a bit, right? That's the conjugate acid of a weak base, okay? Now, if you're like, oh, Mr. Dion, I'm totally confused with conjugate this and ba base that, acid this, you know, I'm, I'm racking my brain here, man. Okay, well, remember, I'm never going to give you a problem that has all of these in it at once. Okay, that would be impossible. You're only going to have a couple of ions at a time. And as long as you just take a hard look at it and evaluate each case by case, I think that you're going to be able to master it pretty quickly as long as you just kind of take just a step by step approach. Okay, you can also have amphoteric ions like the bicarbonate or the di. Um, uh, the dihydrogen phosphate um, ion. Anyhow, and we'll, we'll look at examples of those in a little bit here. Now, I, would even, I even admit here in my slides that the equilibrium calculations for salts can be confusing, okay? But if I ever ask you on a, an exam, and this might be worth the value of maybe one multiple choice question on your next exam, if I ask you to take a look at a salt and just say, is it acidic or basic? If you were to take this salt and throw it in water, does it make it something that's acidic or basic? Right, pH less than 7 or pH greater than 7? You can answer it really quickly just by looking at the sizes of the Ka and the Kb. Okay? And we'll look at an example of that. So if Ka is greater than Kb, it's going to be acidic. If the Kb is greater than Ka, it's basic. And if they're equal, then there's, it's neutral. There's some thought-provoking questions that I put here. I actually put these in these slides the last time I taught this class. You know, um, how can aluminum cation, how can that be an acid if it doesn't contain uh, a proton? It's because it's a Lewis acid, right? Do you guys remember Lewis? Kind of a gun, Mr. Dion. We can't spell today. Lewis. It's a Lewis acid, so it's an electron acceptor. Okay. And what else? What do the acidic ions have in common? Um, like I said, they're both the conjugate bases of uh, uh, strong acids and the conjugate acids of weak bases. Anyhow, the polyprotic. Well, with all that in mind, let's take a look at some problems. And I think this is probably where we're going to end since we've only got 19 minutes left today. Um, it says here, calculate the pH of the resulting solution to 25 degrees Celsius if each salt dissolves 100% completely. Okay, let's take a look at A. So if we have 0 0.40 grams of calcium nitrate, and calcium nitrate, 
in 154 milliliters of water. Now we could take the time to work out the number of moles of calcium nitrate, the number of moles of calcium, and the number of moles of nitrate. Um, we, we can do that, sure. There's no problem with that, really. But I want to think about. Oops. What I want to think about is this. I have a question for you guys. If you take calcium nitrate, okay, and it dissolves into calcium cation plus the nitrate anion, there's my balanced equation. Um, I have a question about these two ions here. Will either of these ions affect the pH of the solution? The calcium ion or the nitrate ion? All right, Jamil says no, okay? Now, even without memorizing the table, if we go back, we see that calcium is gonna have no effect and the nitrate isn't gonna have any effect, right? Nitrate is the conjugate base of nitric acid, which is strong. And calcium is a cation that would accompany what? Calcium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And so neither of these are gonna have any effect. So if you're wondering, Mr. Dion, is that the answer to the question? Is that all I have to do? Yeah. So two people wrote no, and another person wrote they shouldn't. Well, you're all in the right vein. The answer is no effect. So no effect on pH. Neither of those ions are going to affect the pH in any way. Well, let's take a look at something that is going to affect the pH. Okay, let me just move. Let me erase this. Give me a second here. There we go. Okay, so let's move on to B. And here's something a little more interesting. We have 35 grams of potassium cyanide in 250 mils of water, and they give us the Ka for hydrocyanic acid. Now, in potassium cyanide, right, if you have KCN, it's ionic, right? It's going to break apart into a potassium ion and a cyanide anion. Before we really get into the guts of the problem, can anybody tell me, will either of those ions affect the pH of the solution? So I've got a potassium and a cyanide. Now, you don't see cyanide on here, but you do see potassium. And potassium's on there, and that's not going to affect anything. So my question is to you, will a cyanide ion affect, this, affect the pH? So Jamil says yes. Does anybody agree with him? Disagree? Okay, he's getting some, some votes, okay, from people that are agreeing with him. Now, if you were on an exam and faced with that question, you were asking yourself, like, Ethan, is, is cyanide going to affect anything? Like, some people are saying, yeah, it's basic, yeah, it's going to have an effect. Well, let's think about it. What's the conjugate acid of the cyanide, right? The conjugate acid is HCN, hydrocyanic acid. They even gave us the Ka for it. If they gave us a Ka, is HCN a strong acid? No, it's a weak acid, right? We only get Ka values for weak acids. So if this is a weak acid, aha, I know that this is a strong enough base to affect the pH, right? This might not have any effect. Okay, I don't have to worry about that, but I know that cyanide has an effect, doesn't it? Ah, there we go. So now we're, you know, getting started here, right? We're getting rocking and rolling. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine the concentration of the potassium cyanide so that we can figure out what the concentration of our, our cyanide ion is, okay? So how would we do that? Well, we have the number of grams of potassium cyanide is 35 grams of potassium cyanide. I've gone ahead and looked up the molar mass of potassium cyanide because I was too lazy to, to add three um, atomic masses together. Anyhow, yeah, so I have 65.12 grams per mole. So that would give me the number of moles of potassium cyanide. Divide that by the volume, 0 0.250 liters, right? On the numerator, all I'm doing is I'm solving for the number of moles. And then the denominator, I have the volume. So I end up with a concentration, which is, what did I get? I can't read my own writing, 2.15 molar, okay? 
So that means you're starting out with, let me erase some of this pick and scratch up here. You're starting out with 2.15 molar potassium cyanide. Now it's going to dissociate completely into 2.15 molar potassium ions and 2.15 molar cyanide ions. Give me a thumbs up if you just follow me thus far. Because I think that in my solutions, I might have made like a little ice table explaining this in more detail. But since I don't have as much space here, did everybody follow me that on that? It's a concept we've looked at many times in this class, but. All right, cool. Okay. All right, I got a couple people following me, so. Okay. So we've got our cyanide ion. Okay. You know what? Let me explain this. Look, if we've got potassium cyanide, and we know the concentration is 2.15 molar initially, it's going to break apart into a potassium cation and a cyanide anion. You've got none of these. Since it's completely ionic, it's going to dissociate 100%. You're going to gain this much on both sides. So equilibrium, you have none of this. You have 2.15 molar potassium and you have 2.15 molar cyanide. Okay, so that's where I got this number from. Okay, nothing more than that. Now I'm going to delete it. I'm going to delete all this. I'm going to start over here. So delete. So what have I got? I've got my cyanide, which has a concentration of 2.15 molar initially. It's going to react with water as a base, produce hydrocyanic acid plus hydroxide, like that. Initially, I have none of these. There's going to be a change. I'm going to lose some of this. I'm going to gain some of these. At equilibrium, I'm going to have 2.15 minus X. Here, I'm going to have X. Here, I'm going to have X. I don't have my KB, do I? But I do have my KA for the conjugate acid. So I can solve for my KB. The KB is going to be equal to the KW over the KA, which is going to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 6.2 times 10 to the negative 10. So my KB is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. So is this concentration 100 times greater, or sorry, greater than 100 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5? Yes. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 100 gives you 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3. So the assumption is valid. And so I can write out my expression that my KB, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, is equal to x squared divided by 2.15. Like that. I'm going to skip a little bit of the steps here because I'm running in a room. And I'm going to say that my x, which is equal to the concentration of my hydroxide, and my hydrocyanic acid is equal to 6.2 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. I'm going to double check that. Check that here if it wants to be. So 6 point, yep, yeah, looks good. So this is my concentration of my hydroxide. And so it's asking me to calculate the pH. So I write down that the OH is going to be equal to the negative log of 6.2 times 10 to the negative 3. POH is going to be equal to negative log, so I get 2.21, 2.21, and therefore my pH is going to be 14, 14 minus 2.21, and you get 7, 9. There you go. That's my pH. Kind of cool, huh? How you can just take a salt, potassium cyanide, which is really dangerous, right? A lot of people have used that for suicide. would recommend it. Anyhow, um, so, yeah, you can see how just by giving, you know, a mass and a volume, we're able to calculate the pH of a solution, you know, of a salt. It's kind of interesting. Now, if you're the kind of person who likes to leave no stone unturned, and I probably won't do this all the time every class but if you want to double check the assumption which we know is true already right but if you want to check the assumption using the five percent rule you have the amount of base that's produced 
which was what? 6.2 times 10 to the negative 3. You divide that by the initial concentration of base, 2.15. You multiply that by 100%, and you get something that is less than 5%. And so it's, the assumption was good from the get-go. All right. There you go. Good stuff. This is a lot of fun. Look, we got eight minutes left. We can do another one. You guys want to try Pirate C? Anybody with me? Okay, I got two, three people who want to give it a shot. Look, again, I don't want to sound like a dad, but I am a dad. Okay? If you want to protect your investment, you know, you're investing your time, your money, your resources. You know, you could be you could be partying somewhere right now. Well, maybe not nowadays, but you could be. Anyhow, you want to protect, you know, you don't want to waste your time in class, right? Again, before you come to class on Wednesday, why don't you try the next 10 problems? Right? Try to read ahead, even if you just take a look at them and give them your best shot. Even if you mess up, mess them up. It's no big deal. Hey, no big deal. Give it a try because if you come to class and you just watch me solve problems, it's just a pretty hard way to learn chemistry, right? It's very hard to just watch it, you know, and then be able to do it, right? You know, I heard a person say one time there is almost nothing. There's nothing that I can think of. Can you guys think of something that would be an exception to this? There is nothing that can't be learned on the job. And he said, it wouldn't matter if you were an obstetrician or a brain surgeon. He said, literally anything, if you've got the talent for it could be learned on the job technically you know I, I, the more i thought about it you know i worked as a chemist most of my life i thought yeah yeah you could learn everything on the job really you really could anyhow so you learn by doing in this class all right okay what time 10 30 we got lots of time let's try this last one maybe i'll go a little quicker here uh it says you get a 0.25 uh 0.25 moles of ammonium chloride in 10 liters of water. Well, you know, ammonium chloride is completely ionic. What's the concentration of our ammonium chloride? It's going to be equal to 0 0.25 moles divided by 10.0 liters, which equals 0 0.025 molar. But since that's 100% ionic, you know that we're going to have a concentration of ammonium and a concentration of chloride. They're going to be 0 0.025 molar. Now, if I look at these two ions, chloride is not going to have any effect on pH whatsoever. It's the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid. No big deal. Ammonium, however, is going to affect the pH of the solution. It's the conjugate acid of a weak base, ammonia. So let's get going. Pitter-patter, let's get at her. So we have our ammonia. We put that in water. How is that going to affect the pH, right? It's the only player that's going to affect the pH. The chloride's still there. It doesn't do diddly squat. So we end up with some hydronium in the solution plus ammonia in the solution. We know that initially we have 0 0.025 molar this. We got none of this. We're going to have a change. We're going to lose some of that. We're going to gain some of these guys. At equilibrium, we have 0 0.025 minus X. Here we have X, and here we also have X. Now, we don't have, or we don't, we do have the Ka for our ammonium ion. So, is the concentration, the initial concentration, greater than 100 times the Ka? The answer is absolutely it is, right? 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10 times 100 is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 8. This is a whole hell of a lot bigger than that. And so our assumption is safe. So we can say that our Ka, which is equal to 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10, is going to be equal to x squared. Come on, Mr. Dion. Divided by 0 0.025. Am I the only person that when I try to do something faster, I end up making more mistakes or just being slower in the long run? So 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. Multiplied by 0 0.025, take the square root of that. How many times have we done that today? 3.7 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, which is going to be equal to the concentration of my hydronium. And therefore, pH is going to be equal to minus log of 3.7 times 10 to the negative 6 pH. 
Cha 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 is equal to 5.43. There we go. pH is equal to 5.43. Just like that. Okay. There we go. Again, if you want to check using the 5% rule, maybe this is the last time I do it. I say that all the time, though, don't I? So check. We have a concentration of our acid, which is 3.7 times 10 to the negative six, we divide that by 0 0.025, we multiply by 100%, is it less than 5% 3.7, times 10 to the negative six, divided by 0 0.025, multiplied by 100, and you get 0 0.0, so 0 0.015%, which is less than 5%, therefore it's okay. And we knew it was from the get-go. So. What I want to be sure of is that you understand the rules for assumptions, right? And that's something that we looked at at the very beginning today. So again, in this problem, since we're dealing with weak acid, we said as long as the initial concentration was greater than 100 times the Ka, the assumption is good. And then we can check our assumption using the 5% rule. If you understand that, you can be awesome at problems that involve weak acids and weak bases.